Hello, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for joining us on our weekly MIM webinar series. This is Siva here, the CEO at the Malaysian Institute of Management, and uh, I'll be giving a very brief introduction of our webinar series this afternoon. The MIM webinar series are offered as part of our exclusive benefits to our members. And uh, in view of the recent MCO, it is being extended to the public on a complimentary basis. And this is actually our sixth session. And if you want to join us for future webinar sessions, I would uh, encourage you to join, uh, go into our website, www.mim.org to join the uh, future webinar series. And uh, this afternoon, we have uh, Munir. Hi Munir, how are you? This is, Hi, uh, I'm good. Thank you, it's good to see you all again. Right, it's always great to have you on board and, and uh, thank you so much. Each time we reach out to you, you're always uh, volunteering and say, hey, I'll be there. Great. And uh, welcome, welcome. yes, and we have, uh, you know, our distinguished panelists also with us. We have uh, Mr. Julian Neo, who is the Managing Director of DHL Express for Malaysia and Brunei. Hi, uh, Julian. Hi everyone, how are you guys? Hope you're all keeping well. Thanks Mr. Siva for the introduction. And uh, we have Mr. Shah Priya Ruben, who is the CEO of Lazada Malaysia. Hi Shah. Hi, I uh, hope you guys can hear me well. Uh, hope everyone is safe at home. Uh, yeah, looking forward. Right. And uh, without further ado, I will pass the session over to Munir. Over to you Munir. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for, for letting me moderate this interesting session. Um, Julian and Shah, really nice to, to see you uh, virtually. I hope to see you face to face one day, of course. Um, so today's topic is really interesting in the sense that everyone talks about the challenges that all companies are facing. Um, but what people also keep saying is that, well, for the logistics companies, it might be a little bit different. Um, so when we are talking about DHL, for example, um, it would be very interesting to hear more insights from Julianne about how things are going there, what, what have you done differently and so forth. And Shah, um, being in Lazara, I mean, we are, we are staying in the same building in Singapore pretty much. I mean, we are, we are also in the AXA building, so I do meet a lot of your, your colleagues there. And, and I love the energy in Lazada and I know the, the way that you've been able to innovate your way through um, the, this, this uh, pandemic. So instead of me sitting here and talking about what you guys have done, I would love to hear, hear it from you yourself. So I will let uh, Julian and Shah take over from here. Um, I'm not sure who of you want to go first, but I know you've prepared a, a short presentation to just set the context for the panel. Um, Julian, you, um, I think you can go first here. Okay. Yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for this afternoon session. Actually, we didn't present, uh, we didn't prepare any presentation. So I'm Julian. I'm heading up DHL Express for Malaysia and Brunei. So we are part of the DP DHL Group, consisting of uh, more than half a million employees. Uh, globally so we are i'm representing express and i've got three other business units in malaysia which is the dhl supply chain that does warehousing dhl e-commerce which is the last mile delivery and also dhl global forwarding focusing on air freight and sea freight thanks uh, Munir. and shah if you could just share a little bit about what, what's happening in uh, in lazada as well mm. Hi guys, uh, I'm Shah, uh, Chief Operating Officer for Lazada Malaysia. Uh, I've been a bit, a bit of background about myself. I've been in Lazada for eight years now, going into my ninth year. I joined uh, in the year 2012, the year it was uh, was launched basically. Um, obviously, I've seen uh, how the online uh, landscape uh, uh, moved throughout the years uh, in terms of uh, customers uh, purchasing behavior towards uh, getting more online. Okay, thank you very much. So 
I know that there are a few questions uh, from from the uh, from the panelists as well. So if you have any questions, um, you can use the Q and A session, and I will help you ask those questions. But of course, I'm very curious about how things are going with you. So I have some questions for you, Julian and, and Shah. Uh, and being from Gojek myself, I can also tell you that um, things have definitely changed for us. I mean, uh, of course, people have stopped using uh, the taxis, and people don't order the motorbike rides anymore for example in indonesia because it's simply not legal anymore you can't be two on a motorbike unless it's your family member so uh, i would love to learn something from you two guys so i could start with uh, if i can start with you julian i would love to know how has the covid 19 impacted the end mile industry thanks uh, munir it's an um, interesting question so um yeah, so when, when during the initial stages of COVID-19, right, what we saw was uh, we started with an outbreak in China, right? So um, China being the key manufacturing site of the world, obviously the overseas manufacturing operations experienced a huge, huge disruption. China was closed for more than 70 days and um, there were obviously a shortfall of all components um, where many, many companies, including companies in Malaysia that were typically sourcing from China. So for instance, right, production in uh, car manufacturers in Japan, Nissan, I could quote, Hyundai in South Korea, Fiat Chrysler in uh, Europe were all temporarily suspended for days due to lack of these components from China. And for us, we could see the impact on four fronts. One was um, airlift capacity, right, air freight capacity. Global capacity has seen a huge decrease in terms of air freight re due to the reduced passenger belly capacity. So let me just give you an example, right? To and from China, to and from China, the passenger bellies accounts for at least 45% of this capacity. So although DHL, DPDHL has uh, closed about 300 planes around the world, that's not enough to fill half the gap of what's even required out of China. And that's just talking about China alone. All right, so that's one, air capacity reduction. And with air capacity reduction, you will see a huge amount and hike in terms of uh, rates. All right, so the whatever carriers who's got hot space are charging you a bomb. I can, I, can, I can probably see some feeling from the SMEs in Malaysia. So second one will be border closures. From our own study, which we do it through a Resilient 660, um, we have identified at least 24 jurisdictions around the world which has enacted some form or another of border closures. So with border closures, that will then restrict movement due to in terms of logistics. So that's number two. Number three will be posters, di postal disruptions. All right. So postal disruptions across the world that's also hindering uh, uh, movements. And why I say it's affecting the, the globally because DHL across the world, we've got very strong partnerships with postal officers around the world. We, we don't service every postcode in the country. We don't service every uh, uh, remote area, so that's where we work very closely with the postal officers in the, in the countries to reach out to the last mile. And fourth, and last but not least, is the port disruption, right? So you got vessels, vessels from affected regions and countries are not allowed to, to, to berth in the ports. And of course, there's a huge crunch of um, workforce as well. So with, with all these uh, checks and safety precautionaries put into place, um, foreign workers, and impact on workforce is, is is also felt across the industry. So four, four, four key areas from my side, Munir. Great. Thank you for the insights. Really interesting. So when it comes to, to Lazada, um, I do understand that you chose to di diversify your offerings a little bit. Um, and and but, but why did you choose to diversify your offerings, although you would say online demands were already peaking during uh, this pandemic? Yeah, so uh, generally speaking, uh, even uh, uh, pre-CO or pre-lockdown uh, in Malaysia, we were already seeing some changes in terms of search behavior on the platform. Uh, initially, we already had a good, um, strong strategy on how we want to grow certain uh, part of the business uh, for a distant sense uh, groceries for example uh, but when NCO kicked in uh, we had to accelerate that growth almost immediately because uh, demand for uh, what we uh, what we don't normally sell is there which is like you know uh, groceries fresh and frozen uh, uh, fresh and frozen meat and veggie right 
and uh, so we quickly uh, had to basically uh, start thinking about an immediate supply right uh, generally speaking uh, this is the time that it would really make sense uh, to start uh, looking at uh, fresh and frozen farmers like the one in Cameron Highlands the first pilot that we started uh, we managed to uh, in a very very uh, accelerated way we had to create a quick supply chain uh, helping them connect uh, their produce to the the cities in uh, in, in in Malaysia uh, it was a uh, I, I would like to say i mean it was it's a really good success uh, we basically managed to achieve two very important things here uh, we had to number one uh, meet the consumer demands as they cannot go out to get their basic essential needs and also we get to sort of really assist uh, these farmers uh, on uh, still sustaining the business throughout uh, MCO. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why, uh, I mean, yeah, generally speaking, uh, the industry shift in terms of demand, you know, uh, there will be less people who want to buy fashion, for example, and more towards FMCG. So we had to basically change gear there. Yes. So that, that's that's really interesting. I mean, that that's change management on really high level because I can see some of the supermarkets here in Indonesia they're really struggling to 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 you know to manage this change. So the change management is not that straightforward, especially mm -hmm. if you're not already digital. So Julian, how do you think we can? I mean, how should the retailers adjust their strategies to meet more local and international expansion moving forward under these new conditions? Thanks, Monir. I think what we're seeing is if you look at the latest January survey, right? Malaysians are indeed spending more online, right? So the survey sort of said that yeah, um, Malaysians are spending 60% more online than prior to, to, to COVID-19. So that's already an indication of, of how the trend has changed uh, pre and post COVID. So from our side, uh, not just uh, for, for the logistics, but to all retailers, right? I, I think it's really important to monitor the trends like what Shah is saying, the changing trends of consumers to be more communicative, communicative during this period because um, our sister company, DHL e-commerce, who is handling the last mile delivery of, of the DP DHL group, right? The volumes have sort of tripled and quadrupled during this period of time. And obviously, when, when the volume has uh, kind of tripled or quadrupled, there will be an, uh, an impact on service, right? So it's very important to be communicative and to support the new journey of the, the new purchasing journey of the customer. So it's extremely important to make the product searchable. Uh, response to queries, so more and more people will, will be inquiring on your on your on your websites. Simplify shipping and payment process. So for us, I think uh, DHL, we are sort of advising customers to work with trusted partners instead of building your whole new uh, eco whole new ecosystem. Work with trusted partners. Lazada is a trusted partner. Trusted partner. DHL is a trusted partner. You can. Um, uh, leverage on the network, the experience, and um, the, the partnerships that we have to go international uh, in that mode, uh, Munir. So okay. I think what, what, what I wanted to add also is uh, to look at what some of the sectors that are doing well, right? So uh, for, I want to give you an example. For example, there's this UK brewery called BrewDog, right? So if you are brewer, brewer you, you should know have a capacity to put liquid into bottles, right? So in that case, you don't put beer into bottle. What you can put is you can switch your production line to put sanitizers into pearls, right? So that's one example. And then for circuit board makers and for other industries like healthcare, uh, you're very clear about your capabilities and you can use now skew your production line to be, to, 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 to be more into the healthcare and also the PPE division. That's really interesting. So if we could continue this question to, to you, Shah, how do you think retailers and business owners could strategize so they can build their own online presence um, while still being mindful of, of the cost of and overheads? Because we we know how challenging it is to, to make change management at that level. I mean, I still remember when I was working for Maxis in Malaysia, I mean, the, the topic everyone was talking about, not just in Maxis, everywhere is digitalization. We need to go digital. There was a lot of talking but very little action from from especially the SMEs because it's it's not that straightforward. So what would you say, uh, what advice would you give them in that field? 
Okay, so I mean there is retailers and then there is SMEs, right? They both have very different approaches uh, approaches yes. when it comes to uh, coming online. Of course, um, retailers uh, they already have the advantage given uh, the financial uh, stability they have, the uh, even in terms of uh, manpower, uh, operating uh, capacity, uh, stock capacity, they are far ahead of the curve here. Uh, it's basically um, what change, like you said, what change management they are willing to do uh, when they come online. Uh, yes. That's why I mean, uh, e-commerce platforms like Lazada, uh, we have uh, a lot of this facilitation that we put in place to make things easy, right? I mean, I'm talking about uh, managing inventory via our portal or uh, any e-commerce portal uh, per se, uh, payment gateways, uh, even the marketing efforts, the traffic efforts. Uh, it's same as like a mall, you dri- when a mall drives traffic of people into. Uh, their premises, right? It's, the, it's actually the same thing that what Lazada does online, uh, and also uh, how we set up uh, an education hub within the platform to help bring these retailers on board, right? And then, uh, I mean, we have been doing this for for, for years now, and like uh, uh, as a BAU business as usual, we always onboard brands. But during this MCO period, obviously there was a huge spike. I mean, within a couple of weeks, we were reaching around like uh, close to 200 brands already. Uh, and uh, they come from various categories: fashion, beauty, groceries, etc. Uh, some examples would be like uh, Senheng, Bata, Fujifilm, uh, even uh, big franchises like Din Tai Fung. Uh, they all came online, right? And guess what? They really adapted really quickly. So uh, a lot of this proves a lot of over worrying when you come online, uh, yeah. where what we all have to do is just start, and then. Uh, what happens after that is adaptability, which uh, naturally happens among uh, businesses, right? Uh, yeah. But when it comes to when it comes to SMEs, uh, this is where I think we need to reach out a little further, uh, which is very important. I mean, um, our awareness of the need to go online could be better uh, in Malaysia. Could be better. I think the 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 the, the it is not as default as Malaysia, for I mean, as Indonesia, for example. If you talk about, if you look at Indo- uh, Indonesia, just by looking at data on how many people go online every day, uh, not only that, I mean, of course, in terms of population, it will be higher. But if you take a ratio about how fast they grow immediately after they go online, you can tell that the knowledge gap is quite there, or the awareness gap is quite there. What they need to do when they come online, uh, and, and in Malaysia, we need to reach out a bit, a bit more uh, closer to our SMEs. We need to hold their hands a little bit, uh, like what we put in place uh, during the MCO. I mean, uh, we governments uh, were basically announcing like uh, stimulus packages for citizens, right, uh, for middle class income to assist them in these uh, tough circumstances. They call it the Prihatin package, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, we got inspired by that and then uh, Lazada started uh, our own stimulus package for SMEs. Uh, we call it uh, Kedai Package Pintar, uh, smart package, uh, smart shop package, basically. So, what this thing does is, uh, it essentially provides zero cost for any SMEs to come on board, uh, number one. Number two, it provides uh, assurance that when you come online, when you upload your first product, Somebody will be there for you on what to do next. What are the other fundamentals you need to do when you come online? The tools you need to adopt, the uh, the uh, the logistics uh, operations that you need to know of so that you can fulfill your order. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, like these SMEs, if at all, SMEs are the one that were heavily affected in terms of cash flow. Uh, if they want to really, uh, you know, how you say, nitro oxide your business online. You can't do it uh, without cash flow. That's why we facilitate uh, loans as well, micro loans as well. We partnered with Funding Society and other partners to uh, basically connect them with our SMEs that come online so that they can help with uh, micro loans with low uh, interest rate and fast approval rate basically. Uh, yeah, so the, that's how we, we, we try to uh, uh, forefront uh, digitization of SMEs as well as retailers as well. Yeah. So I, I know Monier. there's a, yes. Sorry, Monier. I'd just like to build on what Judge Shah just mentioned, right? About uh, companies and retailers and SMEs going online. 
it's pretty much the same picture as going into international expansion, right? So it shouldn't be taken for granted because I think global trade will self-heal even uh, post-COVID, right? It might be different, but it will self-heal definitely. And internalization has affected the world in many, many areas. So, so picture yourself, right? Picture yourself on an average Saturday, um, sitting at home, having your, your bacon and egg muffin, and then listening to Spotify on an iPhone designed in California, wearing a yoga wear imported from Canada with a laptop produced in China, right? So the world is at your table, actually. The world is at your table and you don't even think twice about it. Getting a yoga pants delivered in 24 hours today, it's almost nothing. And you don't even think about what happens behind behind the scene, right? In such model, marvel, modern logistics. But in, in just one click, and the same day dispatch can happen. It's, it's extremely easy to make everyday comfort today. So one example for me, right? So uh, just just to share, US run out of avocados in three weeks, all right? Avocados in three weeks. If it closed its border to Mexico, all right? So that's globalization in, in action, right? As, and in many parts of the world, avocados has exploded popularity in the United States because the United States alone consume one billion kilograms of avocados per capita. So that's increased by 400% since 2001. So imagine if you close your borders to just Mexico and just talk about, you know, thinking about international expansion, right? That is already uh, a big impact. And then how about lychees, right? The golf ball size uh, fruits are tasty. Do we know that Madagascar produce the most lychees because of its climate? So I think like what Shah was saying, going online and going into internet expansion shouldn't be taken for granted it is no rocket science you learn as you go across so that's from me i mean uh, to add to that right uh, really quickly uh, sorry uh, when, you, uh, uh, when the surge of demand happened during mco it affected uh, like uh, like julian said uh, uh, a certain part of the supply chain into a very serious manner uh, but uh, at the same time what we realize is okay you have obviously a few uh, big SMEs or big sellers in a platform uh, that uh, normally uh, handle most of the supply but because of what happened uh, supply becomes a bit scarce but what happens as well is that uh, this supply is shifted to more smaller more medium SMEs in the platform that carry the same uh, type of product and and they start to sell, they start to grow now uh, because the, 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 the demand is just going up and uh, it is even more to the point on why everybody needs to start thinking to go online basically. Yes, absolutely. If, if I can go back to the retailers, uh, Julian, what, what are the last mile strategies that, that retailers can use during this peak demand that they're experiencing at the moment? Okay, but I, I would say um, from my experience and working with a couple of partners, it's, it's don't put your eggs in all, all your eggs in one basket. So you have a good ecosystem. Each partner is strong in its own way, and um, and each partner is strong in its own ter territory and geographically. So I would suggest you look at the strengths of your partners in terms of uh, what they have and what they are able to to fulfill and also complement your, your, your current strategy and work with them on that closely. Because by just building a website, right, doesn't mean that consumers will come and visit your website. You can't just open a website and expect people to flood in, right? And many a times, um, you got to work with partners who are strong in their areas. For example, a search engine optimization. Many of us who run a business, we're not experts in SEO, right? So you look for a partner who is strong in SEO, look for a payment partner who is strong in payment, look for a partner who is strong in, in marketplace, look for a partner who is strong in logistics. That would be would be my advice for the last month. Great, thank you. Um, I know we have a number of questions. Let, let me ask one last question before we, we go to the Q&A session. Um, so th this is for you, Shah. Um, how can an organization ensure operational efficiency if they want to cater to the influx of online purchases? Okay, uh, good question. So, um, uh, obviously, an uh, e-commerce platform like us, uh, we do a lot of heavy forecasting almost uh, uh, every day, basically, right? Because we need to connect with our, our logistics partners, our sellers, who essentially are the, 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 zero, the zero mile of fulfilling orders. Uh, that's why forecasting and uh, trend checking is very important uh, so that we don't hit into a wall or we don't get into a backlog 
uh, we don't into uh, run into customer issues, right? So, uh, I mean, we uh, we're quite equipped. We are fortunate enough to be equipped with. Uh, 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 Alibaba Tech uh, to really uh, facilitate this kind of things. Uh, we are able to tell uh, what is the trend that is picking up, uh, what kind of category or subcategory of items that is really moving, uh, which will allow us uh, or to help us make decisions on increasing capacity on the logistics side or diversifying stock between different sellers to meet customer demands. At the same time, uh, maintain good customer experience. So uh, uh, it's a essential part. It's a core. It's a core operation thing that what we do basically. Uh, but uh, hence, I mean, saying that uh, it's very important to know that we cannot all we cannot always do it do everything uh, ourselves, right? We need to have an ecosystem. I think ecosystem is a really buzzword these days, but it's a very important word uh, when it comes to this sort of stuff. So when I say that, what I mean is, uh, you know, um, uh, we actually engage with our sellers to help other sellers. Uh, and uh, advising them what they need to do uh, if your business search or there's a, a lot of customer inquiry that comes because influx come in many shape and forms not only just orders but when when orders come you're going to have uh, more customer inquiries you're going to ma- have more uh, uh, fulfillment to do so it's a, it becomes a really complex thing right uh, and uh, when you have uh, uh, strategic partners be it logistics suppliers sellers and the community who shares the same value i think you can able to strive to achieve this mission perfect and and i know it's it can be really challenging for for retailers and smes to do these things and from your experience those who joined before uh, the pandemic and um, do you see a difference between how fast they managed to get onto this new norm uh, this new normal compared to those who joined after the pandemic yes i mean uh, um Uh, yeah, so uh, they took time. There were, how you say, uh, struggles for sure, but uh, it was uh, we had a good uh, support system. Uh, we basically tried to cover one hundred percent of every seller that come on uh, that just newly came online, uh, and then try to hold their hand at least for thirty days uh, to basically run the fundamentals right and. Uh, with a, ma- a scalable way to basically add radar to all of these. So when you say, let's just say we have uh, 500 new sellers that come every day, right? That's uh, let's let, maybe it's a uh, uh, 10x or whatever we used to do, hypothetically speaking, right? Uh, but uh, we, when we see this this number come up, and uh, we look at uh, how many of those have sales, what are the orders they are carrying, uh, do we need to worry if one of them suddenly uh, has an unexpected uh, demand maybe suddenly people want to buy uh, tissues but this guy didn't realize that he's going to sell out immediately right and he, he panics that he needs to fulfill the order in 48 hours or so but we we can flag this and when we flag this we reach out to the seller or the retailer uh, to make sure everything is okay in terms of uh, whatever part of the business they need to run great really interesting great insights so um, i know we have a number of questions so i'll try to to run through all of them in case I don't my apologies because I, I also know we have a time limit um, but the first question is and um, this is for Julian do you foresee uh, bot operated live or AI platforms uh, to get to be adopted in your future roadmap to improve business efficiency and responsiveness Yeah, interesting question. Um, so we have, you know, we've we've prepared our BCP for the longest time, and and we test it a um, couple of times a year, right? So um, it is interesting because DHL's call center, which is um, a, a, a frontline engagement point, a touch point, we feel that it's very close to our heart, and we keep all call centers where we are operating in each country. We don't centralize or regionalize our call center like some of our our uh, other carriers, right? So. Po, po, pre, pre, sorry, post MCO when China started opening up after 70 days of being closed, the number of calls uh, to our call center sort of uh, tripled. All right, so tripled, and that's where we thought, you know, and and that's where we thought, okay, we were testing our bot, we were testing our digital assistants at that time on POC, so proof of concept, right? And then we didn't, we 
always like all MNCs and global organizations, we try and get everything 100% perfect before you roll it out to the market to make sure that customer has a good experience dealing with. But you know what? This whole COVID thing just accelerated everything. We, we thought that, okay, it's the right time um, to tell customers that it might not be perfect. It's 92% there. But in view of the crisis, uh, please forgive us a little bit if the engagement experience is not perfect. Hence, actually, we roll out our digital assistant and bot um, five weeks ago. And then um, the number of calls have reduced. And because people, pe- people prefer to chat, although people like, like to call us because we answer our calls in three rings. And then they don't have to press number one for this, number two for that, right? Or number zero to speak to a customer service assistant. You three rings to pick up your phone. And but I am ple- pleasantly surprised to see that the chat has been increasing day after day. Malaysia now is ranked number two, Monir, in Southeast Asia. Sorry, in Asia Pacific, number of chats per day for DHL. Wow! <laughs> wow! I didn't know that. Okay. Hey, th- thanks for for a very enlightening answer. And um, th- there's one. I mean, there are several questions. But the next question is is actually for all three of us from uh, Mohammed and Nurul. Um, so he's asking, you three adapted a lot to respond to COVID situation. My question is, how much did you do extempore? I mean, uh, but through planning, and how much of it just came up? You know unplanned and we just had to to pretty much wing it and be really agile. Uh, Sha, you, you can go first. Uh, it's a bit of both. I mean, uh, we had to do, uh, obviously when MCO was announced, um, what was uh, inconsistent, I think Julian can, uh, can watch for this, uh, is that the, the the restriction of delivery in different areas are not really consistent anywhere and it's hard to tell our sellers that uh, uh, you can go and drop off your parcels uh, in this area no worries you know uh, uh, we even though we have you know government issued letter uh, or what not allow us because we're an essential partner right we are in the essential industry uh, it is still inconsistent because some sellers still get restricted by authorities and all that so uh, at that point like you said I quote we have to wing it and uh, uh, we had we, we did stuff even as visiting the local police station of that area to uh, to uh, uh, mitigate the issue. That's the that's the level of detail that we went into. Uh, I myself actually went into a police station to uh, to say, hey, uh, we are allowed, we are allowed to uh, to to operate over here, right? Uh, you see, but um, at the same time, we need to be responsible as well. Uh, uh, when when we were labeled as essential, as an essential company that we can operate under these circumstances uh, the responsibility still lies with us to make sure we don't contribute uh, 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 in a negative manner to this COVID situation that means we need to respect when uh, sellers say they can only work half their capacity they need to go into an AB split program and this we need to respect and when they do that uh, that means uh, all our us- usual SLS to our customers becomes very different uh, they become longer right uh, and uh, we need to match the customers and obviously we cannot say to the sellers no you still need to do it within 48 hours no so what we did was we planned to extend the SLA uh, in the in a, in the appropriate uh, period of time so that they have time and they're not stressed when they when they when they fulfill their parcels uh, as well right and um, uh, obviously on the logistics side uh, warehousing side they had to do a turnaround as well they need to put in some regulations uh, uh, towards contactless delivery almost immediately and that they had to do almost overnight right uh, because logistics were allowed to operate at that time but they still need to take responsibility on uh, contactless delivery as well um, okay. then uh, that is the first part of the MCO uh, and uh, when we were asking ourselves would it extend obviously we were monitoring cases day by day and uh, we planned uh, every planning since then was two situations if MCO extended if MCO did not extend so we had two plans all the way till now it's the fourth extension if i if i'm correct and uh and but we had a non uh, a plan that if it's not extended uh, when it came to our campaign planning our fulfillment planning our forecast planning yeah yeah very interesting Ju- julian um anything you can add here yeah sure 
so for us, um, I I think what we have, the biggest learning that we have picked up from this crisis is to make sure that we invest ahead of time. So one of the things that we have done really well that made help us prepare for COVID nineteen was the investment that we made back in two zero zero eight on a yeah. program called Certified International Specialist. Right. So this is a cultural big huge cultural change program. 100,000 of our employees. So that sort of prepared ourselves very well uh, in terms of the readiness, the agility, the passion, the can-do attitude, um, and the speed that we are known for. So for us at DHL, um, when when the crisis started, right, there were three things that that um, that sort of um, help us prepare. Um, first and foremost, to make because we kept we are all allowed to operate under uh, essential services. First and foremost, so to make sure that our people are safe. And kept healthy, and that, that's not just physically safe, right? In in terms of uh, keeping them safe, but also mentally, because many of the staff were asking, "Will there be retrenchment? The volume has dropped. Will there be a, a job security and all that?" So that's where we did really well. Secondly, is to make sure with all the crunch, like what I mentioned to you, the border closures, the air freight capacity reduction. How do we still ensure we kept the best level of service to our customers? So that was second, and third was to make sure that our BCP hold up. So our BCP, which we have been testing and all that, but like what Shah say, things, things got very fluid. Things changes on a, on a weekly and daily basis. So we have to keep our, our BCP fluid as well. So I think keeping a leadership team, a, a response team and an action team was very crucial for us to make sure that we remain agile in this, uh, in this situation, Monia. Yes. I mean, the interesting thing about COVID-19 is it forces us to innovate on our feet um, and, and simply don't have time to, to do the same kind of plannings that conventional companies typically did in the past. Well, when I'm looking at GoDeck, I mean, we, we, were, we were, of course, impacted as well, just like all other companies. So we, we have around 2 million partners, uh, so driver partners and merchants and so forth. So we, we had to come up something for them i mean we, so we established a, a fund to see how we could help them to stay in during this challenging period at the same time we had to create new partnerships we had to create new products and so so we, we are though as a super app in, in the region we are used to come up with with new products all the time so so this wasn't really that new to us to do that but it's more the speed and the expectations on how are we going to do it that that was really interesting during this time but definitely there will be a lot of learnings we as companies will take away from this. I mean, if, there, if there's one thing uh, COVID-19 have helped, that definitely bring the more conventional companies into the digital age. So um, we have a number of other questions. Uh, a quick one here to, to you, Julian. Is DHL uh, using drones to deliver packages in Malaysia? As of now, uh, in Malaysia, no. That's a, a plan put in place. Actually, we were we were about to do a POC actually quarter three this year. I I'm not able to share a bit more details. Um, but in China, we have started. In Africa, we have started, and in Germany, we have started. So for Malaysia, plans are in place. We are very very close to do a POC, and I'll share with you a little bit more when I have the details. Thank you. So Shah, you mentioned earlier that you, you, you've had a spike in demand uh, since COVID-19 has you know, happened. How do you manage the needs of, of, uh, of increasing the workforce so upscaled so rapidly to, to cope with the surge of online shopping and deliveries? Uh, so a uh, few facts, I mean a few verticals. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how companies have totally changed their mind on, on where to work from. And lately, I saw Twitter telling their employees, you can work from home forever. Um, I'm not sure whether it's all employees, but, but I mean, we've also seen other co tech companies saying, hey, guys, don't expect to get back to work before 2021. So um, what we in the past thought was impossible um, is now suddenly becoming the, the norm. So I used to say, well, this COVID-19 is just a, a very normal. But, but it, it seems to be a, a new normal. Um, that, that, that's at least the trend that I'm seeing. So we well, have I'd one more. Like to, I'd just like to yes. add to what Shah is saying about the workforce, right? So with workforce, uh, we don't have such much of a challenge for DHL because um, 
we are usually we have some buffer in terms of uh, cater for extra volume i think i'd like to build on what i shared earlier about the the air freight crunch that we face globally right so this is yes. where i think no man is an island the shaft spoke about this a lot no man is an island no matter how big you are no matter how strong your brand is are smes or what even in the lights of Lazada and dhl are both relatively large organizations and gojek for that matter right so if you do not have a strong partnership and a strong ecosystem to ride on and you just rely on that 300 planes that we have we would have not been able to fulfill a lot of our global requirements in terms of getting parts out and components and and shipments out from china to and fro into the other parts of the world so i'd like to just re-emphasize the point right so uh, resources wise you, it, it's good to have your own resources but partnerships are extremely crucial in today's ecosystem yes absolutely um i mean the, the more digital we get the more important it gets and and th- this is one more reason for corporates to really take very good care both of their vendors and their partners because in the end, we are all working together towards the same goal, which is to be successful. So if your Correct. vendors succeed, you will succeed as well. Um, so th- thank you for pointing that out, Julian. Um, Shah, there's a question to you here. Um, Lazada is doing some amazing things helping SMEs navigate through COVID-19. What are some of the logistical efforts and initiatives that were put in place to be able to do this? Mm, so, um we can a good example of this was uh, when we did when we started to do fresh and frozen. Uh, before COVID, we have never done that because uh, fresh and frozen requires P to P delivery, point to point. You need yeah. to pick up and deliver the same day. You can't do sortation or whatnot, right? So, uh, but we were never uh, into that business anyway. Uh, unlike you know Grab and Food Panda, who does P to P essentially, right? Uh, but Lazada was you know you have the dry groceries and then you have the your your electronics and uh, uh, and fashion and all that. So uh, when we heard about the, the you know the Cameron farmers uh, situation. Uh, we at the same time we looked at our search trend. What is people searching on our platform? It's like uh, okay, they're all searching cabbage, potato, fresh fish, and then you have uh, and then you have uh, farmers and uh, and wet market uh, business women and men who can't sell, and they're throwing the produce right. So uh, the first thing was I mean uh, the team in Lazada uh, contacted uh, these farmers and understand how we can. Uh, really put this in place. So uh, you say, okay, let's uh, have, for example, a, 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 a quick hub in Klang Valley, for example, so that they can consolidate the veggies. And then we quickly uh, get a P2P partner uh, over the phone and tell them to come pick it up tomorrow uh, uh, immediately. So uh, tonight we just work on putting the vegetables online. Tomorrow uh, it's live. Let's see if it orders. We have a P2P partner ready to pick it up. So it started like that. It's just it was like let's do it now, mop it later kind of situation, you see. And then uh, uh, and uh, when it started to scale, and then we, uh, it, we take the next step, which was uh, refining the supply chain, uh, refining the process with the P2P, and start to even improve the uh, visibility of uh, farmers' shop on the platform. So that's how it grew basically. Yes, and and it's definitely something that's making your employees very proud that, that you are out there helping the farmers who actually need help to sell their products. So, um, so yes, even, yes. even I though mean, they, they were very proud, they were uh, at one point this the team was basically working almost twenty four seven. Like uh, they did not know what was weekend anymore. All they cared about was is the farmers, uh, the wet market uh, businessmen and women making sales or not, if not, why, what we need to do next, if they are making sales, how do we grow them further? And it was just the same working attitude throughout the two months and it's uh, we're very fortunate to have this kind of people in the organization basically. Yes. Yeah, so, so so it's quite interesting to see how a lot of employees have reacted to, 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 to these situations. I mean, there are a lot of companies where all employees uh, just drop their salaries just to make sure that, that they can continue their business. Other companies like Gojek, for example, uh, the senior leadership team dropped uh, their the salaries with 25%. The employees didn't get an increment this year, even though they were supposed to get uh, get it. This just to be able to help those who are more needy. In this case, for Gojek, it was the the, the partners that we are having. So, um, so I would definitely say 
the the human side of of us have really stepped up during this period where we we put self being selfish aside and being more selfless in this case so it's really beautiful to see that so many companies have stepped up um so yeah th thank you for sharing that anecdote with us um there's one more there are a few more questions but there's a question here um for for you julian but i would love Shah to answer it as well so what Harris is saying here is business has been very good for companies like DHL and Lazada and other last mile delivery companies. Revenue has grown exponentially the past three months. Is this a correct reading of the current business environment for the last mile delivery companies? I'll take that first, Munir. Yes. Yeah, I think a couple of days ago you would have also read in the papers of the revenue performance of, I would say, Post Malaysia. So Post Malaysia has seen a huge volume upside in terms of last mile delivery, right? But that doesn't always necessarily translate into, into profits. So revenue is, uh, is vanity, profit is sanity, right? So it, it doesn't always translate into profit. So I think um, you, you, you can't say that. Revenue might be really good, but it, with the amount of resources you put in, us, the amount of effort space that we have to buy at a premium, the amount of um, extra work that you have to put in to make sure that we keep the supply chain going has to be considered. So in that point, um, I would say uh, revenue and bottom line at this point of time, sometimes is very blurry, but the whole purpose of connecting people and improving lives is to make sure we get all these shipments across the border and make sure that we keep the supply chain and global trade going. Absolutely. I mean, a company like DHL, I don't know what we would do without, for example, DHL, because who, who would transport all the goods that we, we need to survive? So, um, so yes, I'm definitely aware, and it's a good point that, that sometimes what DHL are doing and some of your uh, others in the same industry, they might even go as far as losing, uh, losing money to make sure that they can deliver the service just to make sure that, that the economies can keep running. So it's it's a form of, C of CSR without you really shouting about it. So uh, thank you right. for that. Yeah, Mudir, there was also a question Eileen was pointing out to me about our our extra surcharge during this peak, peak timing, right? Yeah. So I think there was a question from one of the, um, the Q&A. It, it is yeah. barely, we, we, we know it is extra charge. We're not putting the whole cost back to the, we're taking at least 70% of this cost. We're just passing down 20-30% uh, to the consumers, right? This extra airspace that we're purchasing from the market is at super premium. And this is just to make sure that we keep those PPEs and uh, ventilators going to make sure that uh, we're keeping the global trade going. Because I think that's important. Living exactly. up to our purpose. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because obviously the supply have decreased. I mean, there are fewer airlines who, who can operate in this during this period. I mean, there, there are so many restrictions, but the, the demand hasn't fallen. So, of course, your vendors will also have to charge you a higher price and hence you, you need to react to that. So thanks for pointing that out. Shah, anything you want to add here? No, I think uh, Julian covered it quite well already uh, uh, in this part. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So um, let me see that the next question is, do you feel that consumers would continue buying online when the COVID situation eases, especially when people feel comfortable to be back into malls and streets, given that e-commerce sales still has small share compared to overall sales? Um, so, so, I mean, in this case, when it comes to me, as soon as I can get out of this house, the first week I'll probably not do any online shopping. I would tell, I would gladly go and do grocery shopping for my wife while, while I was hesitating in the past. Um, but, but how do you see it will go after that first week when we are all excited to be let out from our little prison? So, um, it's a good question, right? I, I obviously uh, don't know for sure, but, uh, but what I see, right, based on trend today, um, obviously we are, we went through different phases of NCO. Uh, we went through the most stricter one and then the conditioned one, right? Which is slightly more lenient. Uh, and uh, when that happened, I think you still see uh, quite a number of people outdoors. Uh, also in malls in some cases, as long as they are, they, and they are meeting the, the required uh, social distancing requirements. Uh, but we didn't really see a much deterioration in terms of uh, sales performance online. 
to be honest with you and i think uh, the the reason why is people may realize that okay uh, we still can go out but uh, we don't need to go out to buy groceries per se although we don't need to go out and buy a food you can go out to hang out to 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 meet your friends and what not but why uh, uh, not all of them will say okay now maybe now like you said new normal would be just i will start buying groceries online so we ha- i'm sure a lot of this conversion has happened in many categories in the platform and uh, i would only uh, assume that this, this kind of conversion will happen in, in across different more categories uh, obviously uh, groceries is one of the most obvious one but then now uh, maybe people will start buying fashion online already uh, and don't need to go out but uh, it, it really depends yeah. yeah julian anything you would like to add here Uh, from my side, I think uh, Monir, it will take a while the supply chain to rebalance. And and talking about shopping online, right? This is part of the whole sub- global supply chain. It will take for a, a a while for this whole thing to rebalance because there's a whole massive shock to the system, right? So if you look at the papers yesterday, yesterday this restaurant, this restaurant has sort of uh, created a sort of a barricade or a divider between the tables, right? So some restaurants are very comfortable to say, you know, I will just take the uh, uh, order food. I will let people around dine in. But the faster, the faster you adapt to the new normal, the quicker you're going to get out of it. So what I'm saying is, um, it will take a while for the whole supply chain to 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 rebalance. And then this demand for home delivery has sort of rocketed, as what Shah said, right? But many a times, majority of these sellers are losing money. Today, they just they're just doing it. The last mile, they are subsidizing it just to get revenue into the door to cover to t- to cover costs, salaries to be paid, rentals to be paid. But the big challenge is when the reality hits home. Is when your boss asks you where is the ebit and the bottom line. You're going to take stock of how this whole thing is going to happen. So I think the rebalancing will take some time. Yeah. I I actually see this as as a way to educate our consumers. Because if if you see what what uh, what, what some of the payment uh, the, the digital wallets did, I mean in Malaysia and worldwide worldwide in general, they were subsidizing people to start paying through their mobile phone because they wanted to make people used to pay online or uh, sorry pay through their mobile or do shopping online. So a lot of these companies, it was typically unicorns and startups who did into this that that had heavy investments. Because they were really looking at the future, you know, how can we educate people to start going more online so people would get so used to it that it becomes a new normal. With right. this, I mean, COVID-19 has really done these companies a huge favor because today you are forced to do everything online. So in that sense, we, we don't have to subsidize a lot of these things just to make people used to go online and, and, and pay for things. So um, I personally see uh, an, an increase in the future, just like uh, what both of you said, uh, in online shopping in general, whether it's groceries, mobile phones, or anything else. Um, good. Let's see the next question. Um, we are seeing a proliferation of various payment solutions being introduced, which may accelerate the use of digital payments. Any chances for Malaysia to go fully cashless in coming years? And um, yeah, I mean, this is for Lazada, but I'm I'm sure you can add something here, Julian, if you feel like it. So, uh, I think the simple uh, answer to the question is yes, for sure. I think uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, organizations like uh, Touch and Go, Boost, uh, even Grab Pay are uh, uh, already putting into places programs that that will. Um, convert customers to to pay through 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 wallets right and this will only grow uh, because you are start they are starting to i mean we are starting to build an ecosystem together and uh, eventually this will happen and i think it will not just be uh, used for retailing uh, it will be used for many many other things maybe going towards banking etc right and uh, and this will uh, definitely happen when uh, 100% i'm not sure but it's uh, showing it's progressing quite strongly towards that number 
Bonier, from my side, I totally agree with Shah. I think it's a, it's definitely a, we are on the right track, and you have just uh, said it well. This is a excellent time to educate people to to move on to more of these digital channels. From my side, we are you know DHL. It's very much a B two B. Of course, B two C is growing over the years, but it's still a small chunk of our our revenue. In the B two B side, you know what? It's only ten less than ten percent of our customers pay us through checks. The rest are all payment online. So ever since we have opened up um, into more payment options, where customers are getting points, getting rewards and incentives over there, it's just picked up big time. So only less, I think it's about five percent, seven percent of our customers pay us through the traditional method. The rest are all online, and this is just business to business, yeah, B to B, not even B to C. Yeah, yeah. Well, then, then let's hope that people start removing their fax number from their business cards in the future. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It includes DHL so, as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, oh, we, we only have a few minutes left. So I, I'm sorry. I know we have a lot of questions and I, I got excited myself with, uh, with all the excellent answers and insights that you could share with us. Um, but I mean, I, if you have any closing remarks you want to you wanna say before we end the session, please go ahead, Julian and Shah, before I give uh, the, the word to Mr. Siva. Uh, I'll let Julian start first, yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks, um, Munir. So a couple of things from my side, just to to see one of the key learnings from, from COVID-19. As of now, we keep, we're still um, evolving and learning. But three things um, that we have picked up. One is to make sure that you don't put your BCP back into the closet and have dust covered all of it. Continue to enhance on your BCP because we're learning new things every day. And then for big organizations, please continue to do rapid iteration and experimentation because, you know, a company as old as us, 50 years old, sometimes we are very scared of taking risks compared to Lazada, who is, can, who is very agile. DHL sometimes is probably not as fast, but we're learning a lot from this, like what I've shared with the chatbots and some of the things we're doing with contactless delivery. And then I think we re- really need to look at our investments. Where do we put our money today? Uh, it's for, if it's for me, I will be putting a lot of my money on digital channels, omni channels, and rather than big offices because people can work from home. Absolutely. And then one of the new things, uh, Monier, we have just launched recently. It's a DHL on the go. It's shipping through WhatsApp. So try it. Go to our website, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Try it. It's totally contactless. Shipping from where you are today. Pay online, and you can use it on the most used uh, communication channel, which is WhatsApp. That's from me. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Cool. So uh, I think uh, I think we almost got one minute basically. So I'm just gonna be really quick. I think uh, uh, the key the key here is uh, uh, adaptability and uh, embracing change and how agile can you do or how agile can you be in the situation. I think it's very important. Uh, we. We need to learn how to take uh, risk. We need to learn how to mitigate the risk, but in a very, very fast pace, right? And that's yeah. very important. Uh, and if you do this nicely, I mean, we, we it's always okay to have that uh, do now, mob later kind of attitude in certain times. It's okay because uh, you get the the objective done first. You will have some drawbacks here and there, like like uh, like many things you do in life, basically. But uh, as long you you we capitalize on the situations uh, and then we refine later, it's always a uh, it's always the thing we could do right and the most important thing is that we embrace that change and we just keep moving forward and uh, it's like the same thing like uh, 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 a month ago I would have never thought that uh, the Lazada would do groceries fresh frozen let alone hot food uh, I, I could never guess that we've done that and then we did it in a matter of one week uh, we had a lot of problems we didn't nothing went perfect right I mean we had a lot of problems but uh, we just spent time on the problems later that's all and then uh, but what came out at the end of the rainbow is like we we helped uh, SMEs who are in trouble times we helped even uh, we still help Ramadan Bazaar to continue to run online which is a very important sentiment thing uh, sentiment thing to the Muslims out there uh, pre, pre Raya right so uh, it's very good uh, I think a very good uh, impact that we make here d- despite a lot of rough around the ages I guess yeah Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. I know we are running out of time, so thank you, everyone. Uh, Mr. Siva, you want to have a closing remark before we end the session? Right. Uh, Munir, Julian, and Shah, thank you for the great insights you know, and the many leadership lessons that you have shared, especially on change management. 
and uh, munit thank you for being the moderator yeah, well. of this session and i'm always very happy you know and thankful to thankful, thankful to you because each time we reach out to you and you're always volunteering thank you so much yeah well, and yeah. Sha, thanks to everyone at lazada you know i'm getting my fresh vegetables okay <laughs> good you welcome you welcome we will we'll do better <laughs> Uh, the 48 hours uh, farm ERP digital transformation was amazing. That is a great success story, right? And keep up. And uh, Julian, I just dialed 1800. I just stepped out just now. I dialed 1800 uh, 888 and 388. You know what's that number? Yeah. Your call center. Yes. Uh, you, and I must tell you that you know it was within the three rings. Uh, the call was answered and i just waited for less than 20 seconds and there was this person zaiti picked up the call thank you congratulations you, you know um, you guys are really walking the talk and i want to thank you and i want to thank all the members and everybody who have joined i also want to thank pua and my team for keeping this possible stay safe and uh, see you all soon take care thanks bye bye